Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me that uh, I have this opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts concerning the idea of personhood in the context of uh, uh, what's going on in extra legal sciences and uh, more broadly speaking, uh, the challenges posed to the idea of personhood in law uh, by uh, changes in extra legal culture. Uh, what I'm going to present is, uh, uh, as they say, work in progress or even deeply in progress. So uh, please let me apologize and advise in, ad in advance that perhaps not everything will be as clear as it, as it could be. I'm going to work further on, on that. Uh, I should begin by a couple of words about the standard concept of personhood in law, but uh, most of you uh, know it very well as lawyers, so uh, in order to avoid uh, repeating platitudes, I will just confine myself to, uh, to three observations which are important for what I'm going to talk about uh, in the later part of my presentation. So first of all, uh, first of all if you uh, look up a textbook definitions of, of personhood in law, uh, you will find out that they usually try to explain it in terms of certain capability, namely to hold rights and or duties. Uh, it means that to be a person, uh, it is understood just to be able uh, to uh, be ascribed legal rights and, and legal duties. Second, uh, what I regard as one of the important achievements of the modern legal theory is the exposure of uh, conventional nature of personhood. That is that uh, no, no one is a person in law by himself without being previously made uh, count as person uh, by valid legal rules. Uh, in this sense, legal personhood is an institution constructed and governed by by law itself. Uh, and finally, uh, the general conceptual distinctions that we are used to apply on a daily basis between object and subject in legal uh, contexts uh, takes a form of a distinction between things and persons. It is quite deeply rooted in, in uh, legal tradition. It originates at in Roman law where we can find this famous sentence by Gaius that each law concerns either persons or things or actions. Uh, the fact that uh, personhood is, an, uh, is a creation uh, um, of the legal order does not mean that the decisions, uh, uh, legislative decisions, who should count as a person are made uh, arbitrarily uh, uh, without any reason. On the contrary, each law actually is embedded is reflecting some beliefs of the lawmaking um, authorities about the world, the, the nature of, of, of the reality. And in respect of the personhood, I would like to claim that uh, actually the belief that underlies the current shape of personhood in law is the idea that could be fairly called juridical humanism. It says uh, that uh, actually human beings are ultimate subjects of the legal order and uh, the pursuit of their interests, whether it is done directly by human beings regarded as so-called natural or physical persons or uh, indirectly through the organizational units, uh, so-called juridical persons. So the human interests are ultimately and finally what really matters uh, for the law. Uh, this idea of uh, juridical humanism is founded on, on the concept of human dignity, which has become extremely popular in the um, legal thinking, in particular in the post-war uh, period. And it, it's popular understanding, including legal understanding. Uh, uh, it is conceived as a kind of metaphysical property that is acquired by each human being at the moment of its beginning, whether it is understood as uh, birth or, or, or conception, and, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, and remains in, 
uh, connected to, to the existence of, of this human being until the very end. And this metaphysical property of dignity somehow distinguishes each human being uh, from everything else, else uh, in the world. We can find this idea expressed in almost each legal attempts, in legal literature attempts to explain what, what uh, human dignity in a uh, legal sense of, 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 of this concept means. Uh, and uh, what is important for, for what I'm going to argue um, is that, in my opinion, uh, this uh, juridical humanism so conceived and the idea of human dignity understood as this metaphysical property distinguishing people from, from everything else, else in the world is uh, more and more at odds with uh, uh, the worldview that is uh, uh, provided by the developing naturalistic or, if you like, scientific uh, uh, changes that, that are taking place in extra-legal uh, sciences. It suggests rather the image of the world in which human species is just one of the unimaginable number of spe species living on just one of unimaginable number of planets in one of just one of uh, unimaginable number of galaxies. So uh, it is very difficult to reconcile this uh, uh, worldview with any metaphysical salience ascribed to, uh, to human species through this concept of dignity. Uh, but it doesn't seem difficult to uh, accommodate the concept of personhood into this naturalistic worldview. Um, uh, it just has to uh, be understood uh, in terms of rather a an empirical a set of empirical properties of an embodied mind uh, than any metaphysical uh, feature that is a person making um, uh, um, that that has a person making uh, influence on, on holders of those of those uh, properties. Uh, from this naturalistic perspective, we can say that all abilities that uh, constitute personhood um, actually causally depend on the relevant, relevant neural structures. Uh, moreover, they admit degrees and exhibit species and individual variations. So it is not the case that uh, all human beings possess all those qualities uh, in the equal degree. And on the other hand, none other uh, organisms or beings uh, have them in any degree. On the contrary, it is the question to some extent independent on the species uh, uh, borders. But nonetheless, the central case, so to say, of a person is a typical adult human being uh, capable of relatively self-conscious and deliberate control of behavior. This is the model, let's say, of uh, what kind of properties are, are necessary to regard uh, 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 example of, of embodied mind as a person, uh, to, 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 as a model to use these terms and define these terms. Uh, and actually the only examples of actual full-fledged persons that we know are some human beings. This is uh, a question of facts, I would say. This, is, uh, uh, this naturalistic perspective uh, entails that there is no inherent relation between the concept of personhood and the concept of humanness. But on the other hand, this is a matter of facts, a contingent truth that at the moment the only examples of persons uh, that we are familiar with are human beings. Not all human beings, but some human beings. Uh, developing further this naturalistic account of personhood and connecting what I'm talking about with the title of my presentation and, and the title of the seminar, uh, we can also uh, say that those properties of the mind, mind that constitute personhood uh, have developed as combination of two levels, so to say. First, these affective mechanisms processed largely by subcortical structures of the human brain, traditionally called limbic system, uh, which are integrated with neocortical regions related to 
reflective um, uh, self-consciousness. Uh, and those two levels are, uh, 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 possess many differences. Uh, affective consciousness is um, a set of mechanisms that are evolutionary older, much older, and long before uh, human species. That's why affective consciousness, this affective level of consciousness is much more widespread in animal kingdom and uh, um, at least vertebrate animals, above all mammals. Uh, we have uh, very sound reasons to believe that all of them uh, possess this affective consciousness. And as opposed to that, reflective self-consciousness is relatively recent in evolutionary terms and almost uniquely human. It is related to, let's say, disproportionate outgrowth of uh, neocortical structures, structures in particular uh, frontal parts of, of, of the brain um, without which any, um, as in the philosophy of mind it is sometimes uh, called second order thoughts uh, would be possible, which are in turn involved in this uh, uh, deliberate reflective self-consciousness. Uh, uh, to quote uh, one of the legends of neuroscience and pioneers of uh, uh, neuroscientific study of emotions, Jak Panksepp, uh, we can uh, capture this uh, saying that human brains are very similar to animal ones at the bottom and very different at the top. Uh, this uh, is exactly, this captures exactly the point that I'm trying to, to make here. Uh, it's obvious that all those facts have clear moral consequences, but uh, do they have also some legal uh, implications? And uh, what kind of implica implications we can try to figure out uh, on the basis of uh, what we know from the biological, neurobiological findings uh, uh, concerning uh, consciousness and th th those two levels. Uh, the answer is not uh, uh, clear and unambiguous, I would say, in, in respect of legal implications. So first of all, uh, I'm rather of the opinion that radical att uh, attempts to radical naturalization of uh, the ap legal approach to personhood that would have to uh, entail replacing human dignity, the concept of human dignity as a uh, critical person making feature by a direct reference to factual attributes of uh, individual mind. Uh, such a radical naturalization seems to me implausible uh, due to uh, two main reasons. The first is more practical. Uh, such term as a personhood and generally legal terms do not operate this way. Uh, the uh, law, in many cases, it's a natural property of, uh, let's say, legal language, has to impose certain, even partially artificial, partially um, conventional uh, borders, uh, impose them on the phenomena which are not, uh, um, which do not exhibit um, uh, qualitative differences, only quantitative differences. So, in terms of personhood, it's hard to imagine how such a concept that would have to refer to very gradual and, and complicated features of, individual, um, of individuals uh, could, in practice, uh, operate. It has to be, to some extent, um, uh, arbitrary, uh, 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 arbitrary division of the reality into uh, zero one, on the zero one basis. And the second reason is much more important, uh, and it's uh, moral in its character. Uh, namely, I think that we should regard the equal recognition of all human beings as persons, uh, a great, perhaps the greatest achievement of uh, modern legal culture. Uh, it was not easy to uh, um, make this uh, idea widespread in the legal world, I would say, and uh, it took a lot of uh, 
difficult experiences, horrible experiences to uh, uh, efficiently or at least re relatively efficiently uh, uh, propose such, such uh, equality of personhood or recognition of personhood. So uh, we shouldn't um, propose uh, withdrawal from this achievement on too easily uh, on the basis of findings that, factual findings that are fallible by, by their very nature and uh, may uh, in future turn out premature or, or even naive. We, we don't know that. So some element of cautiousness is, is uh, I think, quite reasonable here. So uh, I think that instead of such radical idea of naturalizing personhood, something much more attractive is the uh, attempt to find some kind of modest naturalization, a modest version of naturalization of, of uh, personhood in law, which would rely on certain assumption, the assumption that we should not uh, uh, abandon the idea of equal recognition of all human beings as full persons uh, in law on the basis of so membership in the human species, we can call it dignity as a kind of uh, um, useful term to, to express this uh, moral significance of, of membership in uh, human species. But uh, this modest naturalization would, uh, um, should make this concept of, of uh, person, human personhood less exclusive than it is nowadays. Uh, namely, it shouldn't rule out, first of all, the potential or possibility to confer personhood also on non-human creatures, uh, provided that uh, we would discover or create uh, uh, beings with sufficiently developed self-reflective consciousness. Too. It is by no means impossible, just uh, uh, it's enough to to think about uh, genetic engineering and all those experiments concerning, for example, combining human um, genes or, or human um, cells, tissue, with, uh, with animals. So it's quite possible that, that they, sooner or later it may result with producing something which would not be biologically human being, but uh, will be possessing uh, equivalent um, self-reflective um, consciousness abilities. But what seems much more uh, pressing, I would say, uh, is the um, abandonment of the exclusionary nature of uh, the concept of personhood in respect of recognition of subjective interest that may arise um, uh, on the basis of the sole affective consciousness, without this reflective self-consciousness. Uh, in, in this sense, uh, uh, we should somehow uh, detach the concepts of uh, personhood and subjectivity or subjecthood, uh, taking into account that, that it is possible that uh, uh, some entities, some beings may uh, uh, possess their subjective individual interests without being self-conscious and without being able to and deliberate uh, um, articulation of, of those uh, uh, interests. Uh, so it leads me to, to the idea of non-personal subjects of law and the thesis that, that I want to put forward is, uh, is that even the modest naturalization of the concept of personhood uh, suggests that we should overcome this dualist distinction between things and, and persons, to make space for a kind of intermediate category, something in between uh, uh, the category which differs, substantially differs on the one hand from uh, mere objecthood, because such non-personal subjects are able to have their own individual interests that may matter morally and co in consequence legally too. Uh, and on the other hand, they differ also uh, from persons because they are unable to hold any choice rights that involve typically powers to deliberately trigger or waive third person's duties. 
uh, the ability to exercise such powers, to take decisions necessary to exercise such powers, are simply far beyond the scope of this uh, affective consciousness and uh, um, therefore the choice rights uh, uh, constructions is obviously inappropriate for, um, for this kind of non-personal subjects. Uh, and this category of non-personal subjects of law should obviously embrace sentient non-human beings, uh, uh, currently animals, uh, first of all, but in future also possibly those combinations, human-animal combinations, chimeras and, and hybrids, if they uh, are successfully created at, at any moment in future. But perhaps it could be also useful for some marginal cases of human organisms, uh, namely those that currently out of the scope of protection granted to person. I don't, uh, 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 here I don't want to contradict what I told previously that we should retain the full uh, personhood of each human being, but we have also some marginal cases, for example, pre-embryos. Those embryos which are not yet even transferred to the organism of, of uh, woman which are not regarded as persons and therefore are reduced automatically to the category of objects, of biological material or biological waste even uh, sometimes. And we are clearly lacking the category of, of uh, uh, someone who is not yet a person, perhaps uh, um, she will no, never become person, but on the other hand it is unfair to, to reduce it to the category of mere uh, object morally uh, completely uh, indifferent. Of course, uh, well, the consequences of such upgrade of this uh, conceptual status are quite limited. Uh, we can speak about, let's so to say, the right to be taken into account, or more precisely, a right to have one's subjective interest to, to be taken into account and balanced with the uh, competing interest and, and competing rights of uh, third persons and I think that that's all that can um, uh, result from, from such qualification as a non-personal subject of law, but it is not, uh, not trivial, I would say, to this, this difference. Okay, so concluding and summarizing, I, will, I would like to close with three uh, remarks. The first is that reconsideration of the legal approach to personhood personhood seems to be necessary to reduce the gap that is at the moment growing between the natural sciences and important, even crucial, philosophical foundations of, of the law. Second, such reconsideration should aim to reconcile equal protection of each human being as a full person in law with recognition of the status of those whose actual properties correspond to neither things uh, nor persons. And finally, the idea of non-personal subject, subjecthood is modestly naturalistic since it, since it assumes that legal status should be partially, albeit not wholly, dependent on a non-metaphysical conception of personhood that is uh, referring to empirical properties of an embodied mind rather than an idea of dignity as something which is uh, beyond an empirical reality. So, uh, please let me finish with a quote, a famous one from Keynes, uh, about uh, the difficulty which lies not so much in inventing new ideas, but rather giving up the old ones. I think that it is particularly true in respect of lawyers, because we are somehow trained to think according to certain established schemes or established constructions. So uh, it makes me think that even such modest revision is by no means a piece of cake in respect of uh, changing the, the legal, traditional, conceptual distinctions. Thank you very much.